You're listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up! Podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and 24-7 Sports powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, is my partner in crime. You know him and love him as your Denver Broncos reporter for 24-7 Sports. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, we have, uh, we're have we coming off kind of a sleepy weekend, but we have some interesting Broncos news to uh, digest and dissect here today, including Von Miller. We'll, we'll get into it here in a little bit, but Von Miller kind of tipping his cap on what his wish list is for the Broncos at pick 10. Yeah, he definitely sent a message to Vic Fangio. He wants to get him a nice playmaker in that linebacking corpse. And, the, you know, the Broncos fans know who I'm talking about here. And I I for sure hope that he gets his wish. And I for sure hope uh, Vic Fangio listens. It, it should be interesting. And, Chad, the news between now and April 25th is going to come hot and heavy. There really is no offseason. We got a lot to get to today, as mentioned. But first, just a couple of quick matters of business so that we can dive into the conversation and the analysis. You guys, make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. It's really easy to do. Open up the app on your phone. Go to it on your browser, twitter.com. Find at HuddleUpPod. Click the follow button. It's the best way to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. Also, if you haven't done so, take some time and leave a creative review and rate the show on iTunes. The vast majority of you listening to this show, maybe you don't listen on iTunes, but the vast majority of you have not given us a review. Now, I don't want to guilt trip you. That's not how I live my life, okay? But we're, we got a, a goal to reach before the draft. We're trying to hit 200 reviews on iTunes, and only you guys can make that possible. So if you're an iTunes listener, it's really easy to do. Just like with Twitter, open up the app, find the pod, blah, 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 down to the bottom. Sentence or two is all it takes. Give us that five-star review. We assume it's five-star. That's why you're listening to the show if you didn't love it. And help us reach that goal. It's a call to action. It's one small thing that you can do as a listener of the show to help us grow, help us reach new listeners, help us compete in the realm of podcasting in Broncos country. Do that, and you have our appreciation. All right, Zach, so let's dive into this uh, Von Miller Instagram, which he deleted. He has since deleted, but I think it was Saturday night is when I first saw it. But he posted a graphic that included him and Bradley Chubb on the outside with Devin White in the middle. Mm. And uh, some of the effect of imagine this trio and he's got the eyeballs emoji. It, it makes clear basically what he's pining for. And just like I in the, the report that I published on Sunday, and by the way, Devin, Devin White responded on Instagram because he was tagged in it by Vaughn. I'm up for it, goon. So we heard at the Combine too, by the way, from, from Devin White that some very positive things about John Elway, how he only drafts playmakers. He talked very passionately about Vaughn Miller and Bradley Chubb also at the Combine. So I think Devin White would legitimately be tickled to end up in Denver. Uh, Vaughn Miller, obviously, Zach, would love to have that speed at the off ball, but that would make for a ferocious trio for Vic Fangio to deploy. Yeah, it seems like Vaughn's been reading my Twitter because I have that pinned tweet that says Vaughn and Fangio and Bradley Chubb and, and you know, put it all together and with Devin White. That defense is scary, Chad. And, you know, he realizes, like all Broncos fans and media realize, that inside linebacker is still a major need for them. He realizes that Devin White could be on the board. He is the best inside linebacker in this draft class. He saw what Vic Fangio did in Chicago last year with those inside linebackers and his former teammate, Danny Trevathan. It's it's a no brainer, and you know Vaughn wanting to take this defense back to the next level. It all coincides with him wanting to be more of a leader and be more vocal and be more active. There's no doubt it'd be a home run pick, and there's no doubt Elway would give a long you know thought to it. But then that comment that Fangio made a few weeks ago about Devin White saying he wasn't as good as Roquan coming out. I don't know if that was a smokescreen intentionally, like he said there you know there would be in this draft process. Or if he genuinely meant that. Obviously, if it's the latter, uh, he's not much of an option. But there's no denying the on-tape talent, Chad, of Devin White in this defense, surrounded by those beasts at outside linebacker. I mean, it, it just makes the hair on my arm stand up. Absolutely. And it really showcases also, Zach, the the whole 
thing for veterans. I mean, when you really boil it down, fans get excited about first-round quarterbacks. Veterans do not. Okay, veterans, they understand what that means. Nine times out of ten, it's not an absolute, but nine times out of ten, if, if, if a team is drafting a quarterback in the first round, it's step one in some kind of a rebuild. And the veterans have to be along for the ride. And for veterans, they understand what it means when you draft a quarterback. You're going to go through some hard times. You're going to go through a learning curve. You're probably not in a position as a team where you're competing out of the gates. And so veterans, they want that guy, they want that prospect in the first round especially that can help them, that can contribute to the team. And for the Broncos, you know, if you set aside the the quarterback as an option at 10, Devin White's up there, obviously, but I mean, I still would hope against hope. It's not going to happen, but I would hope against hope for Quinn and Williams, followed by, for me, it'd be a toss-up, Zach, between Ed Oliver and Devin White. Yep. And I would be fine with either one, but it would really be tough because Ed Oliver, you know, he could be that next great interior player. And Devin White, who knows? Maybe he is, you know, the next Patrick Willis. But just the only thing that makes me uncomfortable about taking a, a Devin White at pick 10 is just the value. You know, you don't see linebackers, off-ball linebackers taken in the top 10 very often, just like you don't see running backs taken in the top 10 very often because as a position, it's been devalued over the years. There's just so many of them to choose from that you can get. I mean, there's it's and this was another thing that was illustrated in Thomas Hall's great article last week going through the the numbers and the analytics but the drop off from first round graded or first round caliber linebackers to third, fourth, fifth round, it's actually not that big of a drop off. You know, you find pro bowlers in rounds three, four, and five uh, almost as often as you do from linebackers picked in, in the first round, Zach. So, I mean, obviously, Vaughn wants a guy that can come in, though, bottom line, and help today. Yeah, in terms of Vaughn, I really think he's tired of wasting his own prime, Chad. The last couple of years, I mean, he's put in the sacks, and uh, what has it got the Broncos? Pretty much nothing. He's entering, you know, his age 30 campaign now. He knows that he's entering, in a few years, the back nine of his career. He wants to win again. He wants to put together that 2015 championship defense. And with Devin White, it's that last piece being filled. I'm with you, though. The big three on my draft board would be Locke, in no order, Locke. Ed Oliver and Devin White. And after that, they would go to plan B. But to me, the, the the tiebreaker is they have starters on the defensive line. They don't have an inside linebacker starter after cutting Brandon Marshall. I mean, unless you want to just plug Todd Davis or Josie, Josie Jewell in there yeah. to inferior players. It, it's going to come down to if he really thinks that he's not that good as Roquan, if he was genuine. And maybe the Broncos draft Devin Bush. Maybe they trade down. Maybe they can still get an inside linebacker. But – just on his, his tape alone, his production alone, what he would bring the Broncos defense, a longstanding solution to the coverage problems, the tight end problems, just it's everything they needed. It's the last little bit they need. It's the last piece. They have everything else now. And the Devin White, and I think Vaughn sees it, it's just he wants to get back to that level. And I totally get that. But if, if Ed Oliver's there, I mean, look at it like this, okay? Would you rather have Roquan Smith or Aaron Donald? Now, I'm not saying necessarily Ed, Ed Oliver is the next Aaron Donald, okay? But in terms of value and what it brings to your defense, I mean, I think what Aaron Donald is able to achieve for the Rams defense, for example, is more valuable in terms of how it affects the quarterback, how it affects the pass game, how it disrupts the running game, than what Roquan Smith can do for the Bears even as good as he is. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from Roquan Smith. And, you know, you get back to what... Fangio said, I don't really read all that much into it because obviously he has a slanted point of view because he coached Roquan. And not only that, he probably had a role in the the Bears taking him at pick eight last year, right? Because he's he's the D coordinator and linebacker's his thing. So he has a little bit of a vested interest in saying in propping up Roquan, not to say anything of also, Zach, the fact that it's smoke screen season, so it doesn't right. surprise me that he's saying, yeah, you know, Devin White's good, but he's not on the same level that Roquan was coming out. Okay, I think they're pretty close players coming out, to be honest with you. It's sixes. I think Devin White's a faster player, sideline to sideline. And I think back, too, Zach, to what Devin White said at the podium in the Combine when he was asked by a fellow uh, journalist in the in the pit, so to speak, about... You know, in the NFL, the proliferation of the pass catching tight end and how that's become such a, you know, crucial point of and focus of the game. 
you know, do, what do you, th- how do you think you measure up something like that? I'm trying to paraphrase what he said. And he goes, oh man, you, you know, you got troubles covering the tight end, put Devin White on him, use a third person, stand at the podium. So that's been a thorn in the Broncos side, like you've said before, Zach. So, I mean, I wouldn't be crying any, any crocodile tears if the pick was Devin White, but at the same time, as much as Vaughn might dream and, you know, hope that Devin White's the pick at 10, I have a hard time seeing him get past the Bucks at five. I think one thing we can agree on, Chad, is if the Broncos are picking between Devin White and Ed Oliver at 10, they're in a pretty good position. No doubt. No doubt. It's going to be really interesting, and, and that kind of ties into the next topic of conversation for today's podcast, what the Broncos have going on this week with regard to the visits, the, the prospects that are coming into Dove Valley. We're going to get to that, but first, we've got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, Zach. So you wrote about this. Uh, you've you've put together a couple of reports on this topic, obviously, that the Denver Broncos are bringing in some quarterbacks this week. They get 30 mm-hmm. a lot of visits, and they're using five of them, I believe, on quarterbacks. Now, they're going to visit with all four, in, which include Kyler Murray, Drew Locke, Dwayne Haskins, and Daniel Jones. Now, they also worked out Clayton Thorson, but that wasn't an on-site Dove Valley campus workout or visit. That was actually done in the field in the Chicago area. So I'm not sure. I'd be lying. I'd have to look into it if that counts for the 30 pre-draft visits, but let's just assume that it does. This week, though, Zach, tell our listeners what the Broncos have cooking with the players coming in to, to visit the facility. Well, right now, Drew Locke is flying into Denver. He has a two-day visit tonight and tomorrow with John Elway and the Broncos Brass. And then later this week, they're welcoming in Dwayne Haskins from Ohio State. So it's a busy week, Chad, in Denver. Uh, and you look into whether it's it's a first-round option for the Broncos, and Elway talked about it being homework. And I still think it's more due diligence. I still think they're not going to go quarterback. But of all the visits, Drew Locke, the one guy that Elway is smitten by reportedly, he has a two-day visit. So we're all going to read into that. We're all going to read, you know, and, and think that he wants him more than he really does. I don't know what it means, Chad, but the Broncos are covering all their bases just in case one of these guys does drop to 10. Let's talk about Drew Locke and dive deeper a little bit here. On Sunday, we're recording this, of course, Sunday evening. Earlier Sunday, Eric Trickle published his Finding Broncos scouting report on Drew Locke. He also has sent me in his report for Dwayne Haskins as well, which will be coming shortly on milehuddle.com. So look for that. We'll read a couple snippets of it from on today's podcast. But it would probably make you sick how much time, how many hours Eric Trickle put into scouting Drew Locke, the amount of hours he put into watching his film, the amount of hours he put into you know organizing and gathering his notes and then ultimately putting together a scouting report this is a very this isn't just surface analysis let me put it that way eric trickle has done the dirty work on drew lock and zach i want to read to you uh his pros now in every finding bronco scouting report that eric does he lists the pros and he lists the cons to each prospect and you know these are things that front offices across the nfl have to weigh the good and the bad the things the player does well how how that player wins and the things that they need to grow and work at and you know the blind spots here are the pros for drew lock zach drew lock this is from eric trickle has prototype size for the nfl quarterback position of course he's 6'4 228 His arm strength is unquestionably NFL caliber. He does well moving safeties with his eyes. His completion percentage was plagued with drops from his receivers. He was asked to read the full field, especially in 2018, which is crucial. Most college quarterbacks are not asked to read the full field. Their coordinators quarter the field, basically. They have one, two reads, and then if it's not there, throw it away or run. Locke's progressions are relatively quick reading the full field. He moves around well in the pocket, makes subtle movements to avoid pressure. His confidence is easy to see with his behavior both on and off the field, and that is combined with his fearlessness. His release is quick to help avoid strip sacks during his windup, and while it isn't great, he does throw with decent anticipation. His deep ball has decent touch, and he can drop it in the bucket. When he does have to move out of the pocket, Zach, he keeps his eyes downfield. Now, those are the pros. Here's the cons, and then I want to serve this over to you. Cons for Drew Locke. Locke is maddeningly inconsistent 
with his play from touch to accuracy to reads. His footwork is a mess and will need to be a focal point for NFL coaches. Sometimes he plays fast, which leads to some careless throws, and he needs to slow it down some. His placement on passes underneath is more missed than hit. He has a bad tendency to have a low release point, which led to multiple batted passes at the line of scrimmage. He throws when he doesn't have a set base, which affects his accuracy and velocity. When pressure does get there, his technique and bad habits shine and get worse. When facing the tougher level of defensive competition, like your LSUs, your Alabamas, your Mississippi States, his play did not rise to the occasion consistently like you would hope to see. So those are the pros. Those are the cons, Zach. Do you think he's a fit? If you were Broncos you know, GM for a day and you're reading this scouting report from a Broncos scout, what's your take on Drew Locke? I mean, that he checks all of John Elway's boxes. I mean, he's tall, he's mobile, he has a, a big arm, and that's what he looks for traditionally. Whether he's uh, deviated from that, we won't know until April 25th. But he's also a guy, Chad and Locke, that needs a year of seasoning. No one disputes this. Both things can be true at the same time. Fortunately, the Broncos have their starter in Joe Flacco for 2019. They just brought on a coordinator in Scangarello who's known for developing young quarterbacks. So it's a perfect situation. And that's why I feel like he's, you know, his ceiling is higher. That's why I feel like he's a better fit for the Broncos than someone like Dwayne Haskins, who's more pro ready, but I don't think his ceiling is as high as Drew Locke. I mean, you put it all together, and I think, you know, Elway's eyes are just like popping out of his head like a cartoon when he by sees the, Drew Locke. Yes. And by the way, did you see, I think it was Lance Zerline. Did you see that tweet? Oh, yeah. Um, Haskins pull, could fall. Yeah. That, that, in fact, Zach, if you wouldn't mind, I'll serve this up. If, if it's possible for you, find that on Twitter. And then we'll read it to our, to our listener. Oh, actually, I've got, I got it. it. I've got okay. it. You got it? Okay. Yeah. So before the, the we got into draft season in earnest, right, everyone went and we didn't know whether or not Kyler Murray was going to declare. So we're talking like early January. I mean, when you talked about quarterbacks for this class, everyone said – Dwayne Haskins is the unquestioned number one guy. But that tune has slowly changed as we've gotten through the, you know, the main cornerstones of draft season from the senior bowl to the combine to the pro days and to different players choosing to come out and different players choosing to stay in college. So he's I don't think he's really done anything, you know, his pro day and his his combine performance I mean, they were good. There was nothing there that, to me, jumped out as any kind of red flag. And yet, according to Lance Zerline, the media is hyping him up a little bit more than what maybe the actual NFL has to say. And he could he could fall. He might be there at 10. Read that tweet. Yeah, Zerline said, after speaking with a few different teams, I definitely get the feeling that Dwayne Haskins' draft stock was more media-created than team-driven. I see Haskins falling on draft day, and I think the chances are increasing that he is not the second QB off the board. Mm. See, here's my biggest issue with both him and Kyler Murray. One-year, single-year starters. I mean, if I'm comparing them to Drew Locke, who played, started four years in an SEC school, I mean, that's going to be a big draw for me in terms of, you know, their their arm talent and their ability as a quarterback if they're close, you know, which they're pretty close. If you compare the quarterbacking, the actual natural tools and talents of those three, they're pretty close, even though, you know, it'd be, it'd be hard to figure out who had the better arm between Murray and Locke. Locke has the complete package in terms of size, but Murray's arm is damn good too. Mm-hmm. But still, the body of work, there's more there to analyze and compare, more experience, as opposed to, I mean, Haskins had a phenomenal season at Ohio State. What was it, 50 touchdown passes or damn yeah. near close? And 54. Course, yeah. And, and Ridiculous. And Murray won the freaking Heisman, you know, had all those insane passing stats, plus he rushed for over 1,000 yards. or, I mean, it was just insane. But how much do you think, Zach, that affects John Elway's perspective in terms of the single-year starter? I, I don't think it, it, it helps Haskins at all, and I don't think him being a mobile helps him. And I think a lot of it is the Lamar Jackson effect from last year, Chad. This is a quarterback who is perceived as being the best one in the draft class and could fall, and now we're seeing you know, Lamar Jackson take over in, in, in some media. And I agree with what Zerline said. It's a more media-driven thing. He's not the best quarterback from a tools perspective in this draft class. He's not even the, the second-best quarterback. It's Locke and then Murray from a tools perspective. So – 
Uh, you know, he has the one year of inexperience working against him, and he has not being the full package. I don't think when it's all said and done, that's John Elway's guy. I think he's smitten by Locke for a reason. He has Locke in for a two-day visit on a reason, and that's his guy. If he's going to take a quarterback in round one, it's going to be Drew Locke. Yeah, and who knows? Maybe by virtue of Locke spending this time with Elway, for, you know, basically two days, as you said, Elway can become even more smitten. I mean, as it stands today, I think both of us are pretty confident in saying that we don't feel the urgency reading the tea leaves in terms of the Broncos moving mountains to move up in the draft to guarantee lock, right? Last year, you know, they they checked on at least, you know, they, they considered the possibility of moving up to get either Baker Mayfield, which wasn't an option because Cleveland was not going to deal, or Sam Darnold, who ended up going to the Jets. This year, I'm sure that that he's checked to see what the costs are, but how this how this these next two days go for Drew Locke with the Broncos could determine Zach whether or not John Elway ends up kind of reexamining his urgency. You know, does he really want to roll the dice and hope that Locke falls? Because if what Zerline is saying is true, and the NFL is kind of prioritizing the quarterback, you know, board as let's just say Kyler Murray, Drew Locke then Haskins, or maybe even Jones, then Haskins. I don't know. I mean, that throws some doubt on the whole thing. That means that he's in play for those big time. I mean, we already knew he was in play, but he's even more lock in play for teams like, you know, dark horse teams like the Raiders who might take a quarterback. They've a lot. I mean, you look at most mocks lately for the Raiders. They're, they've, they're, they're taking a quarterback at four, mm-hmm. which blows my mind because you still have Derek Carr. But then you've got also the Giants at six. And then you've got the Jags at seven, who aren't as much of a threat to take a quarterback now that they've got Nick Foles, but they're still a threat. If you're John Elway, I mean, these next two days with Drew Locke, I wonder how much room there really is to persuade John Elway to be willing to kind of mortgage the future to move up. You know, that's a good point. I don't think he'll move up for any quarterback, but it reminds me of what he did in the coaching search, Chad, where Mike Munchak was the favorite, and then he had that last-minute interview with Vic Fangio, and that just sealed the deal. So if Drew Locke impresses Elway now, and then let's say Wednesday they meet with Haskins and he blows Elway away, then they might sway some things on the draft board. Then they might change their preferences. I just can't see any scenario where Elway would move up in this draft for a quarterback. I don't even think he'll take one at 10 if, if one's available. But to me, certainly, I don't see him trading up. Let me read you some of the pros and cons here from Dwayne Haskins' scouting report via Trickle. He says, quote, His passing production was outstanding. He has worked with Mohamed Sanu, who took him under his wing. Haskins takes calculated risks to help drive the ball downfield. The ball comes out after a clean motion with good velocity, and it all looks effortless. The deep ball can be driven with good velocity downfield, and it's clean. His feet don't stop moving in the pocket. That's a big plus. He keeps the ball close to his body, which makes it a little harder for rushers to swipe the ball out. His arm strength is more than good enough for the NFL. Haskins will change his release point to make it harder on defenders. His fill in the pocket is good enough, and he makes subtle movements in the pocket to avoid pressure. He's strong enough to shake off sacks and stay on his feet. And as the season went on, Haskins improved every game. And that's true. That's true. I mean, he started out solid, and then just each game he built on it, momentum. It's like a snowball effect. So those are the pros. Here's the cons, Zach. Haskins, his lack of experience shows on the field. In the NFL, Haskins will need to make sure his base on release is more narrow. Otherwise, he will pay for the sailing passes that come with a wider base. He is still a raw quarterback and will need to spend time in the film room improving his reading of defenses. Defenders can bait him to make bad throws by taking advantage of the lack of experiences in terms of reading defenses. He could use more anticipation on his throws. His processing can be slow and will need to speed that up some in the NFL, which could come with more experience. Could use more touch and doesn't always seem to understand when touch is needed. He's not the best athlete and he isn't a threat as a runner. He'll need to better protect the ball when he's outside of the pocket. Now, Zach, between you and me, when I've turned on and watched Haskins film, it's crossing route after crossing mm-hmm. route after yep. crossing route, just letting those elite athletes that the the Buckeyes have at the skill positions just run underneath and try and catch a window with a little you know room to run, a little opening there, 
And he, so many of his big plays and chunk plays and scores came from those type, you know, and then they'd sprinkle in a couple of different shots within each game. But that's, that to me was made it harder to evaluate him is because you just see so many of these and he's very accurate underneath from, from the film I've watched, but it makes it hard to, to analyze and evaluate Zach, whether or not Haskins has the capacity to challenge the whole field. I mean, he's benefited from the system. I just don't think we've seen enough of him yet, Chad, to form an opinion, obviously, whether he can be a starter. But after whiffing on Paxton Lynch, such a raw quarterback coming out of college, and then whiffing on Case Keenum, who was inexperienced as a starter, um, a full-time starter, I just can't see Elway taking that gamble on a guy who has a pretty high floor and not that high of a ceiling, especially for a guy they don't need right away, Chad. I mean, Haskins can come in, probably can start from day one, but they don't need that. They have Joe Flacco for that. They have Scangarello there to develop that quarterback. Like I said, it's, it all comes down to preference, and it will be determined by this week's interviews. It could still change. I just have a hard time seeing Haskins above lock on Elway's big board. Let's shift gears as we're running a little bit long. Let's shift gears and talk about Devontae Bosby, who's Bosby? Bosby? Bosby. Bosby. All right. Devontae Bosby, whom the Broncos signed from the recently defunct AAF's San Antonio Commanders. We uh, talked about that on the last podcast that he was signed. But we now know why he chose because he was he was in hot demand around the NFL because he was the leader in the in the whole league in interceptions. I think he had five. And so we learned over the course of the last podcast and today why he ultimately chose to sign with the orange and blue. And basically what it comes down to is he loves Vic Fangio. He considers him a defensive mastermind to quote him. And he loves Ed Donatel. So we knew that he had a little experience on Chicago's practice squad, so we had some experience with Fangio. But you know what this says to me, Zach, is that we're maybe underselling or underappreciating how much Ed Donatel actually mm. factors into the whole Fangio recipe for success because he's been there every step of the way dating back to San Francisco. Yeah, that's a great point. And also, Bryce Callahan is loves, he's on record as loving Ed Donatel, and he obviously came over to the Broncos this year. But Chad, can this can this signing of Bosby with uh, the, the Curvis signing and the Jackson signing and the Jawan James signing, can this put to rest now this narrative that free agents don't want to come to the Broncos and they don't want to play for Vic Fangio and, and a first-time coach? I, I don't know where that started or if it was a, a team creation, a fan creation, a media creation, but... I mean, they'll go where the money is. They'll go where the opportunity is. Bosby had eight teams interested in total, and I'm sure there was a playoff team in there too. And mm-hmm. he came to Denver for Vic Fangio. I mean, I just can't – I saw that from the opening start of free agency, and they weren't signing many players, and that just kind of stuck in my craw. That And they said that you know players don't want to come here. They'll go where there's lure. They'll go where there's money and opportunity. Yeah. And in the secondary, he has a chance to carve out immediate playing time. Yadam's coming off surgery. Chris Harris Jr. is holding out for now. Uh, you have Callahan and, and as a slot guy. You have Jackson working at safety. He has a chance here. And um, I, I just I hate that narrative, Chad. I hope it goes away now. Now another guy has picked the Broncos specifically for the guy that Elway chose as his new head coach. Defensive free agents are going to absolutely be attracted to playing for Vic Fangio because of the success he's had throughout his career. But it's a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately league, as we talk about on the show all the time. And right now, the image that most NFL defensive players have is Vic Fangio's Chicago Bears leading the NFL in seven major statistical categories. Number one, total defense, takeaways. I mean, they they led in most of the key categories, and they were the second-to-least penalized defense in the NFL. There's some sizzle there, and that's attractive. However, you can go back in time a little bit, to when Fangio first arrived in Chicago the first couple of years, and Fangio's detailed that it took time to add the right talent. Most of it came through the draft, Zach. There weren't a lot of uh, uh, NFL free agent defensive guys wanting to go to Chicago at that time, you know, because there's three years there where the Bears were nothing. They, I mean, even with the tools he had, it took Fangio a lot of time. I mean, it was still fundamentally sound. They were still up there. They were in the top half of the NFL even when he was making lemonade out of lemons with what he had. But what I'm getting at is it took the right combination of players. Now Fangio is very much back into a high-profile type of of reputation in the NFL, and it's extremely attractive. If you're a defensive Mm -hmm. player, 
especially in, its, in the secondary or it, as an edge player. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that can pay dividends down the road, especially if the Broncos can really kind of come out of nowhere this year and, and compete and win some games in the AFC West. Uh, players watch the film just like the fans. They watch the games, and they've seen what Fangio has done. And that's the difference between having someone like Vic Fangio and having someone like Vance Joseph. It's just that respect around the NFL. And it and respect begets respect. You know, it, it, it passes on. It's infectious. And Vic Fangio from day one has been nothing but a good influence for the Broncos locker room. Chad, I have not heard one person say a bad word about Vic Fangio so far. I just haven't, and I probably won't. Absolutely. And – you know, he still has a lot to prove as a first-time head coach in terms of, you know, making that jump and proving that he belongs as a head coach. I've been impressed with everything I've seen from him so far. I mean, it's a night and day difference compared to the vibe we were getting from Vance Joseph when he first took over command as head coach in 2017. So, you know, it's encur- everything so far has been encouraging. And if they can get everything right on offense and if, you know, Joe Flacco ends up being the hit the team totally expects him to be, I mean, this could end up being a phenomenal, phenomenal fit for Vic Fangio because he's really inheriting, and he's talked about this on multiple occasions since he's been able to speak publicly as Broncos head coach, that, I mean, this Broncos defense is light years ahead of the unit he inherited in Chicago. I mean, if you're walking in as a defensive X's and O's guy and your outside linebackers are freaking Vaughn Miller and Bradley Chubb and you've got Chris Harris and you've got Derek Wolf and you got I mean the list goes on I mean he's he's ready to, to dominate out of the gates and then the additions they've made in free agency so Zach they're poised to make a lot of noise defensively the question is what's this offense going to look like with a first time offensive coordinator in Rich Scangarello and a Joe Flacco who's trying to basically prove that he's he's still got some playing, you know, the, his best days aren't behind him. He's he's still got something to prove in the NFL. What a shocker, Chad. Another season that's determined by the Broncos' offense. You know, I mean, I, I think, though, even Fangio has been a boon for the Broncos' offensive chances because they, the offensive players, not only do they realize that the defense could carry them to the playoffs and beyond, they want to go against those players. They want to make themselves better. They want to be around greatness. I, I just— I happen to see, I have happened to notice a very, very stark culture change, and I've seen it inside the locker room, outside the locker room, you know, in, in person, in, in, far away. I just think Fangio has done a tremendous job, I mean, really instilling his own values. Let's shift gears and talk about your report regarding Philip Lindsay's timetable to return. Now, via Kyle Fredrickson of the Denver Post, Lindsay was quoted as saying with regard to his recovery on his wrist injury quote for me i put no time limit on my injury right now when i'm ready i'm gonna be ready close quote so and even fangio you know he's he said that they're not sure when philip Lindsay's gonna be available for the broncos but to me zach i don't really worry about this Mm -hmm. honestly i couldn't really care less if he was put on ice all the way up until the you know the dress rehearsal of preseason because he's such a dynamic player You know he's going to be working his you-know-what off in the classroom. So knowing the offense is not going to be an issue for Phillip Lindsay. It's just going to be a speed-of-the-game thing and football conditioning thing. Are you in football shape? So it might take him a couple of weeks of regular season time to fully get up to speed, but I'm not that worried about Phillip Lindsay at this point, Zach. No, some fans are worried that he won't say anything, and it's it's not a sexy sound bite, but there's no concern about him. If he's not back for training camp full speed, he'll he might even go in the mandatory uh, mini camp in June, Chad. So there's no worry about Philip Lindsay. The only thing is though, with a new offense and a coordinator, a new quarterback, I would like the chemistry to be down and not have him jump right into the fray in the preseason. Uh, but in terms of his injury, as long as there's no setbacks and no long term ligament damage in that wrist, I mean he'll be good to go in the summer, and there's uh, no cause for concern. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing what Scangarello can do because he does have a pretty – I mean, this this these skill positions are teeming with talent. And even though most of it is young, it's second-year guys for the most part. you got Philip Lindsay, you got Royce Freeman, you got Devontae Booker, who proved that under uh, Curtis Modkins, the running backs coach, that he can really be something in the NFL. And then the receiving core – we still don't know what's going to happen with Emmanuel Sanders in terms of how soon the team is going to, is going to be able to get him back. But Cortland Sutton's the number one. We talked about that last week. The team has obviously communicated that to him. So it'll be interesting to see how these pieces come together. What I see from the outside looking in at this point 
is a massive glaring question mark at tight end. You know, Jeff Hireman, if he can stay healthy, who knows? Maybe he he takes that next step in what will be his fifth year in the league. And the Broncos aren't so much worried about the tight end position. And maybe Jake Buck manages to stay healthy. But as we've talked about before, those three tight ends, Jeff Hireman, Jake Butt, Troy Fumagalli combined to miss 34 games in 2018 for the Denver mm. Broncos. So if I'm John Elway, I'm hedging against that by taking a tight end this year relatively high. I'm talking, you know, top four rounds. I'm going after a guy who can come in and immediately be my number two behind Jeff Hireman. Yeah, that's definitely a valid point, Chad. And for me, I want to see how Royce Freeman responds in this role now as the RB1 for however long Philip Lindsay is out. This is a guy who came out and was gangbusters out of the gates last year, looking great. Then he lost his job to a rookie sensation, and he was kind of quiet after that. So I want to see what they can do in the backfield. I want to see how they can use Devontae Booker. Scangarello has known to use those backs in, in space and as pass catchers, and he's pretty good in that role. He's pretty fast. He's never gotten his chance, and Chad, you and I are two of the bigger Booker fans out there. They do have some depth issues, some some questions to be answered, but if they can put it all together, and it starts at quarterback, they can put it all together, Chad. This offense has sneaky breakout potential. This has playoff sneaky potential offense, if they put it all together. But as you and I all say, it starts at one position and one position only. That's quarterback. Yeah. Show me what you got, Joe. Nick Kendall's probably screaming at his at his phone right now, listening to this episode, saying, "What about the <laughs> offensive line?" You know, valid, true, and it's valid. But um, you know, if you assume that Ronald Leary is going to be back in time to play, which I grant is questionable at this time, you know, he tore an Achilles. Usually, it's about eight month timetable in terms of getting back onto the field and and getting back to a semblance of normalcy, but. Even in, let's say in a worst case scenario, Zach, this is your starting offensive line. Garrett Bowles, left tackle. Sam Jones, left guard. Connor McGovern, center. Eli Wilkinson, right guard. Juwan James, right tackle. Now, you're losing some depth if that ends up being your starting five. You, you don't really have those go to guys to, to swing at guard and at tackle, but I think that's a starting five the Broncos could live with in a worst-case situation completely. Let's take away the draft just for a second. If that's the starting five the team had to roll with into the season, I think it would be a solid offensive line under Mike Munchak. But then if you tweak that by putting in Ronald Leary, he's back, ready to go, and he's your left guard. Suddenly Sam Jones or whoever it might be, Elijah Wilkinson, is available to be your swing guard. You're still missing that swing tackle, which is an issue the Broncos need to solve. I mean, at worst, though, it's still better than starting Max Garcia and Michael Schofield, though. So, And I have full faith in Mike Munchak that he will coach up whatever parts he has. And if the Broncos don't put an emphasis on getting a starting center or starting right guard, it's because they feel like Mike Munchak will do that. He will elevate each player to their next level. That means Leary could be a pro bowler. Garrett Bowles can be consistent and above average. I mean, he will make everyone around him better. That's why I'm not worried about the line so much as I am quarterback. To me, Joe Flacco and Scangarello have way more to prove to me than Mike Munchak. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Huddle Up Podcast. You guys get geeked up, get excited, because tomorrow... Zach and I are going to drop a, an actual live, well, we're not going to be, it's not going to be live, but we're going to go through an actual seven-round mock draft together live. We're going to give ourselves five minutes on the clock for each pick. We're going to debate who it should be. We're going to go through seven rounds. It's going to be a great podcast. It's going to be a great conversation, a great debate. So look forward to that for Tuesday's episode. In the meantime, make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. You can find Zach on Twitter, at Kelberman247, myself, at Chad and Jensen. Don't forget to leave your creative review on iTunes. Give us that five-star rating. In the meantime, for Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you soon. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.